Look at those total strikes. So many of them coming in round number two. We go upstairs for the final word for Michael C. Williams. Ladies and gentlemen, having gone the distance, we'll go to your judges' scorecards at cage side. Judge Chris Crail sees the fight 30 to 27, while judges Ron McCarthy and Michael Bell both score the fight the same at 30 to 26. All for the winner by unanimous decision. Hey, My name is Feosa Mabuti Mangbo. A lot of people don't know that on planet Earth um, today, there's more slave than ever in human history. There's 27 million estimated. The chief point of the society said, everyone calls us the forest people. He said, we call ourselves the forgotten. The scourge exists in every country, but 10 nations alone account for three quarters of the world's slaves. Almost half are in India. Next comes China, followed by Pakistan, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Russia, Thailand, Democratic Republic of Congo, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. Fighting in a cage isn't enough, and uh, he decided to go to one of the most dangerous places in the world and dig wells and try to make a difference. Just so uh, you know, in Africa, Congo. in that area, Zaire was the Congo, and yep. Zaire was, was held together by a strong man named Siseko Mobuto. Yep. When he died, essentially the Congo broke into different factions. The Congo is a very, very uh, 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 mineral-rich area, and they always richest in the planet. Yeah, the richest in the planet. I mean, er, the, what you get in your cell phone, the mm -hmm. the material Coltan. you get in your cell. What is it called? Col Coltan. Coltan uh, is mined yeah. there, and, mm -hmm. and it's it, so everybody who has a cell phone has some kind, some mineral. I think typically from the from Congo. The Congo. Yeah, Eighty percent at least. Right, and it's dug typically by hand mm -hmm. by slaves uh, by slaves or or rebel leaders and warlords that control right. the area. And so what happened was not only was there a civil war based on who was going to control Zaire, but more importantly, there were factions that were making a lot of money off of control of those different mineral mines. And right. so a warlord would hire a bunch of guys, couldn't find enough soldiers, would go into a village and literally conscript by force a bunch of children, put mm -hmm. them on drugs, give them a gun, et cetera, et cetera. Add to that, add to that in, if you go back, the, one of some of the worst, most concentrated killing in history mm -hmm. was in um, Rwanda and when the, the Tutsis and Hutu minor, uh, moderates were killed by Hutu extremists to the tune of 800,000 by machete. In 100, in 100 days. In a hundred days, now think about that. In a hundred days, about eight hundred thousand people killed men, women, and children, mostly women and children. Entire villages. It's they would insane. leave one alive, and those guys who did that killing would go into the uh, yeah. into the forest. Mm -hmm. So now what you have now is in, in the Congo, Congo, an area the size of Western Europe. By the mm -hmm. way, we're talking about an area the size of Western Europe. Sorry to give a quick history lesson. No, no, I want to get back to it. Get back to but it's important. It's important no, to just give sure. a little background no, right. of where he went. Yeah. Because listen, I know it's in, so dangerous. In, in many this. ways, in many ways, this area is is considered the most dangerous area in the world. If you have the stats on this, but I think in the right. Congo in the past 15 years, I think over a million people, or I think it's, it might Not be two and a half no, million. No, no, no. It's six million. It's six million yeah. people? Yeah. So I've it's heard the estimates of, the of two and a half, but now Jesus, if you're saying six million, man. that's how many people have died. Think about that, yeah. you guys. And when I think say about rivaling it. the Holocaust, it's from, it's for, that's, that's other people saying that, like big outlets like BBC and sure. New York yeah. Times. Credible sources. Like that, credible sources that are saying that the, the deaths because of the conflict um, and because of the the effects of conflict, the sickness, the disease, everything that comes with it is literally rivaling the con uh, Holocaust. But even before that, you're given a great history lesson. I didn't know you knew all that crazy or all those stats. Like, it's yeah. great. Um, yeah. But even before that, King Leopold took over the country. <laughs> and when, uh, there's a book called King Leopold's Ghost. Ghost. Yeah. Yeah, That's bro. And uh, there was 20 million people in the Congo because of King Leopold and the rubber boom yes. um, in the ivory trade, uh, he said he was saving Congo, but he murdered his his guys ten uh, eight to they ten. They think it was million, half the population. Half the population. Yeah. They, they were forced to work Congo. until they died. So they call that the African Holocaust. Yeah. Told was it was a Dutch uh, king, right? Was he? I think he was from Holland. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or the, the, Belgian. The, the Belgian. Belgian. I'm sorry. Belgian. Exactly. This is the Congo in Africa. It's a vast wilderness and the least explored of all jungles. What's to stop someone from coming in and just destroying all this? What we've done is strategically, through the locals that know what's up, 
like that, that knows the culture, knows, knows what will work, won't work. Um, we go in with a, we go at a slow pace, even though we've done 25 water wells, everything else, like, like and we've gotten 2,470 acres legally, um, purchased, petitioned, lobbied in the name of the pygmies. Nice. In Congo court, the strongest thing you can do is buy land in the name of a people group because then it's passed down from generation to generation to generation. Um, and so what you said is how do you protect it from yeah. from people coming in and stealing it? Luckily, we've selected land. It's, Congo's huge. We've selected land that is far off from any gold mines, diamonds, um, coltan. We select land way off the nearest quote-unquote road. Um, and... It's an hour hike off of it. It's a three hour hike off the nearest road. You can't get there. First off, you don't know where it, people don't know where it is really. Um, you don't have a reason to go there unless you're looking for them. Yeah. Um, unless you know how to get there, unless you know us to get, get you there. And it's not easy to um, get there. The stat for children, and this is on Water 4's website and stuff, and, and on ours, and dude, it's what I want to fight and let people know, because there should be a real public outcry and uproar that 5,000 kids, 5,000 kids under the age of five years old die every single day, every single day because of dirty water, because of waterborne disease, because of waterborne illness. That's a legit stat from like UNICEF or one of those like legit places. 5,000 5, a day. day. It's like it, it fluctuates from like 4,700 or something to 5,000 a day. And like for me, man, I've, I've, I've held two of those children, you know, I've, I've, I've dug the grave. I've had blisters on my hands. I've had a little dude named Andy Bo is blood on my hands. And like, like, bro, it, it's, it, it wrecks me. And like, that's why I'm so passionate about this thing. And like, like I come back and like I, I get it. A bull is terrible and we need to knock it out because it can take out so many people. But why? Why are people not like, why don't they have their eyes open, their ears open, their heart open to hearing about 5,000 kids dying every day? I've been to the funeral of five other kids. I've seen the grave of nine or 10 others besides that. Like, and these are just among the pygmies. I've been to the, I've seen the funerals going on of the, of their oppressors, like the, the slave masters and the Makpala, the non pygmies that surround them, their kids are dying of dirty water. And it's not, I don't, I don't mean to go crazy, but no, it's not crazy at all. It's a, that, that statistic is crazy. 5,000 a day, a day. And they're under five years old. So, I mean, I don't know how many with the six, seven, eight, nine year olds, you know, I've been to the funerals of those kids. We, we are very strange about what we have, what we focus our attention on. And the Ebola thing is just something that was over here because yeah. we were worried about it coming over here and we don't being a problem it. over here. We, we're, it's so convenient for people to not look at impoverished third world countries, people that are just, they've always been in this sort of state of poverty. So yeah. we just sort of accept them at being like that. And we don't think that they necessarily, that they have to live the way we live or have access to clean water and medical. We just don't even think about it. We worry about Cecil the lion. Yeah, you know this, oh, the dude, fucking outrage about Cecil the lion, where everybody's going nuts and freaking out. Yeah, I mean, look, poaching's terrible. It's awful. It's a, animals are beautiful. It's in the, you know, I get it. But the the way we re reacted to that, mm -hmm. to know your statistic, to know yeah. that what you just said, that five thousand little kids die every day from dirty water, and people aren't freaking out about that. I think it's like every twenty seconds. That's insane. Man. I think it's every 20 seconds. That's really hard to swallow. Yeah, and bro, like, I... Uh, wow. That was, that was my 5, second... 5,000 is... That's that's so crazy. Just think about 5,000 dead bodies every day and have them being little kids. Yeah. I, wow. And, and, and the thing that really wrecked me with that was... So I spoke at this university in, in Oklahoma. It's, it's slipping my name, um, or the name's slipping me, but there are students... Um, this is right when I got back from Congo, and they had heard about what I was doing. Um, I think it was Southern, um, it's in Oklahoma City, uh, SNU, and uh, 
and they they said come come speak to our students we want to we want to try to raise enough for a water well and um and dude they set out in their courtyard they set out in their courtyard 5000 white flags and this is a massive courtyard they set out 5000 little white flags and on it said the stat that's 5000 kids every day die of dirty water and so I saw that right before I went up and spoke and I went and saw the courtyard and it just wrecked me because like for me, like the people that see that, like the stat can go in one ear, it can, it can jack with you for a little bit. It can mess with your mind. It can mess with your heart. Um, but it's so easy to go in one ear and out the other. Well, once you sleep, you know, you're not going to wake up thinking about that just from seeing those white flags. And so I, I grabbed one of those white flags and I, and hopefully some of the people just from seeing those flags will get it. But like I had to write Andy Bo on the back. And and then when I got up and spoke, I showed him. I'm like, hey, every one of these white flags, you see it, you saw it, like it's a terrible statistic, but this the real statistic is that each and every one of those flags has a name. Like it's a person, it's a human being, it's a little kid. And like he didn't have to die of dirty water, not in today's age. Not in today's age when we have the answer to the problem. When we know what we can do about it. And just people decide not to, or, or, or like you said, make the uproar about Cecil the Lion. I mean, I, every American probably knows the name Cecil the Lion, or at least 90% probably do. And like, I bet not even 10%, not even 5% know that 5,000 kids every day are dying just because of dirty water. I don't even think it's 1%. Right. I, I didn't know it was that many. That's nuts. Yeah. It's, just, it's hard to internalize those numbers, too. Even if you hear that number, it goes in your head and it sort of bounces around. There's no... There's no like point of reference. reference. Yeah. yeah, it's it's. Do they have this idea of who you are? Um, they know me as Fayosa Mabuti Mangbo. <laughs> That's my but name. Did they, and, but uh, to like like to, to try to. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, mean to interrupt you, but no, you're fine. To you or to me, okay? Like you tell me that five thousand people, five thousand children die every day right. because of lack of water. I can't get that in my head. I mean, I know I, I'm trying. I, and uh, it's I know it's horrific, but I mean my head is like what like this So it's almost like there's no place for it. It's like it's moving around in my head It doesn't there's no yeah. like you tell me your grandfather died. I'm like fuck man dude lost his grandfather yeah. You know what I'm saying it yeah, like yeah, yeah. it fits yeah. it makes sense you tell me 5,000 kids die every day because of a lack of water And I'm just blank. It's yeah. like for me man like I, I absolutely 100% like so that was when I I gave the chief Andy Bo's chief, uh, my my first promise I ever made the pygmies, which was was uh, we had buried him, and he had told us that he was rejected hospital treatment twice, um, so he didn't just die of waterborne disease, but um, his his other brother, his father had died of waterborne disease, and his mom was all alone now, and she couldn't even cry, bro. Whenever I I met her, um, or whenever I uh, I saw her at this time, like she was. Uh, she was she was topless and I could see every single bone in her sternum Like every single rib attached to her sternum because she was so hungry and she was so malnourished and she was so thirsty And so our team went and we got we got mangoes passion fruit um, or mangoes and passion fruit juice uh, rice and tilapia and we brought it back and fed it to her and it wasn't maybe 10 minutes and I, I was wondering is she in shock? Why is she not crying? Um what, like why am I messed up from this so much more than the mother? Um, and it was because she was so malnourished She just didn't have the energy to produce a tear over her son's death. So she got the mango She drank the passion fruit juice. It wasn't 10 15 minutes later that then she started sobbing Because she had like that sugar and that energy a little bit and then after that like dude the next day was so brutal and um I had blisters on my hand from digging the grave and that's when the chief came up and said the first time we went and got treatment They told the mother you're too dirty to come in here um, And she said well, can you give them treatment? I know it's just a pill or a shot and they said you have money She said I'm a slave. I don't get paid money and they said well then go away and then oh. and then the second day they, the whole village and this is like 85 or 100 people they they grab um, everything they can which was uh, like almost two dozen eggs. They, they brought a chicken. Um, they brought a bag of charcoal. Um, they brought firewood. And then they were able to beg because they don't make money, or these ones hadn't at this time. And they, they 
were able to beg enough for three and a half dollars worth of Congolese franc. And three dollars was the treatment. Three dollars was where I think it was a dollar for the pills that would have helped Andy Bo. Uh, They're probably too late for the pills to work, but maybe three dollars um, for the shot, the injection that would have helped them quicker. And it was something like $45. Um, it's in the book. I got the real number. Um, $45 for his casket that I buried him in. And, and it's just like blew my mind that like the, the oppressors, the people that the Makpala, the, the non pygmies that surround the pygmies were thinking like these people are so worthless or, or they're like animals or whatever, that it's, it's easier for us to let them die or cheaper for us to let them die than to take care of them. And, um, and so that's when the chief grabbed me and pulled me to the side and said, F.A., which is uh, F.A. Osa, um, is my first pygmy name. It means the man who loves us. And, um, he pulled me aside and said, F.A., like, we don't have a voice. Nobody knows about our suffering. Can you help tell people? Can you be a voice for us? And that was when I said yes. And that I, cause I couldn't promise them clean water. I couldn't promise them land. Like, I didn't know how all that stuff was going to go, but I knew that through MMA and through like some of the other stuff, like a platform that, Hey, I can, I can at least help these people have a voice of some sort, even if it's just with a hundred people. Um, you know, maybe, maybe I can help them have a voice. Wow. Dude. Whew. Boy, Justin. Sorry, bro. I went heavy. You, no, but don't apologize at all. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you for just being you, man. That, but that the, the, what you've experienced and what you're talking about is so removed from almost everyone that lives here. When we yeah. talk about poverty in America, our poverty is almost ridiculous in comparison mm -hmm. to the poverty that they, these people are experiencing. Right. What, yeah. you're, what you're talking about is just it's not even human. I mean, it's it just it's so, it's so outside of the realm of our imagination to even imagine living in a world where someone won't give someone a three dollar shot or whatever it costs to treat a baby that's yeah. dying, and what this woman have? can't even cry because she doesn't have any food. She doesn't have enough energy for tears. It's, I can't, I can't imagine that world. And you continue to go back there to try to help these people, and now you are gonna fight like not just not just like try to build them wells not just try to help them and get them food but now you're you're gonna fight in Bellator and try to raise more awareness for this what what is it oh, man what does this mean for your family back in the Congo what does this victory mean for them <laughs> this is a lifelong goal for me and I'll be going back wholeheartedly everything else but we, our goal is to empower the locals to be able to do it themselves and so I was there for the first 13 water wells I had um, people from the director of implementation of water for coming and teaching our guys hydrology geology all the different ins and outs of how to drill a well and protect it and um, all the sanitation um, but we're investing in the locals so that they can be the answer to their own problem if mm. that makes sense and that way um, now we have 17 full-time employees Wow. Yeah. And uh, we have two well drilling teams. There's 14 guys on that. And then when they go out into a community, we invite the community um, into the project. We want them to feel a part of it. I don't want to be the hero of this. I want to be uh, a spark plug, if that makes sense, uh, in the engine. I want to get it started, get it running. But the, the people are 
the strength, the engine, the thing that makes it run. The spark plug gets it started, but but the locals and, and investing in them, telling them you can do it, fly on your own wings. Like uh, you just need the training, you just need the knowledge, you just need the tools. Once you have that, you're golden. We want to build relationships, get in touch. We want to be like a family with them and then show them that, hey, we're not just here for, for land um, because that's what we started with first. We got them 2,470 acres of land. That's 10 square kilometers um, in the forest. Then we did the water, and you, now we're doing you food. You got them, meaning you purchased it for them or yeah. had it purchased for them? Right. We, we petitioned, um, lobbied, uh, and basically said, um, yeah, we went to battle saying, I mean, in a peaceful way, but said, <clears throat> these people are the first people of Congo. Not just that, a lot of people say they're the first people of Africa. Whenever we went in um, with, with my team, basically it was like local led. Um, I mean, I was, I was in, the, in the picture, but kind of playing behind the scenes when it came to the negotiating. Um, and they went in there and it was the dean of the school of community development. It was my guy that's uh, the director of Fight for the Forgotten in Congo. And they said, these are the first people of Congo. Why is it that they have zero land of their own? Because shouldn't they have some land to call their own and and we know that looking through history and and whether it was you, whether it was you or whether it was your grandfather we stole this land from them we stole it they have none of their own and don't they have a right to have some land and so that's kind of where um yeah we just lobbied on their behalf and then said so if i bought the land in fight for the forgotten if we would have bought it in our name we would have gotten a five-year certificate and we would have had to renew things and fees and everything every five years if we bought it in the name of the university there that we partner with, it would have been a 25 year certificate. But then at the end of the 25 years, we'd have to pay the same price that we purchased it for 25 years earlier. It would have been hundreds of thousands of dollars every 25 years, maybe more. And um, then we were thinking, it's kind of cool. Um, so in Africa, I would say a lot of the countries at least, have, my understanding is that uh, it was it was the colonialists or colonists or however you say that, they were the ones that set up the boundaries of the countries. It wasn't the tribes. And so, like say Rwanda, the Hutu and Tutsi, they probably wouldn't have put their country together right there because they've had a long history of disputes with each other. So they wouldn't be in the same country. They would have been two different countries. Same thing in Congo, there's over 200 tribes. So um, in Congo, what what's very I don't know, here we're all America, America Pride and or Texas and things like that. But in Congo, it's about what tribe you're from. And so in a lot of parts of Africa, they're really proud about their tribe. And so on the government level, the strongest thing in court was buying the land in the name of a tribe because that's what they respect, that's what they value. And yet nobody was petit petitioning and lobbying on behalf of the, the pygmies. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to go in and say, these people deserve some land. What we did was buy it from the people that originally stole it from them, whether it was them or their grandfather. And so that benefited the people that were basically oppressing them financially. And we gave them years and years worth of salary um, to work with us. And then on both sides, we said, um, so they benefited financially and the pygmies benefited by having their own land. You can't give them a water well without them owning the land that they're on. And so then we said, how can we give you both water? That's what the next step is. And the next step after that is food. How can we start a farming project, teach the pygmies how to farm correctly or farm really for the first time? Um, a lot of them worked for their former masters and stuff like that. But then um, with the Makpala, uh, which means non-pygmies, um, we're like, how can we teach you better farming practices? How can we, you need to plant your seeds deeper. You need to put... Uh, your seeds farther apart because they're not producing fruit because or the corn's only half of a cob instead of a full cob because your plants are basically choking themselves out. So we have three agriculturalists we're interning right now. They've already done a great job, but we're wanting to expand and from three villages to 10 villages. Once they have fresh water, though, there's still going to be the issue of food, though, right? I mean, it seems yeah. like with the logging, you're saying right. that it's more difficult to hunt. Yeah, so what, what, what we've been doing is uh, we're interning the three agriculturalists right now, and we're about to hire them. Um, it's awesome. I'm, I'm so pumped. Um, but the guy that did the 3,500 trees, uh, he's great at farming. And so in three of the villages, we wanted to kind of start it on a smaller scale first um, because it is land, water, and food. And, and we, there's kind of a process to it. You know, you can't start growing food or having water without the land. And then first you need, I mean, you can't live without water for more than, three days, I think, right? Or at least some of it. And uh, 
than food you can live for like three weeks without. Um, and so, or something like that. And uh, so with the food, we start in three different areas, um, three different villages. One's Tundu, and they're the ones. They're, Sangi's grandfather, Leo May, he's one of the most brilliant men I've ever met. Like, maybe he's never gone to school. Uh, maybe, uh, but but I promise, like, the dude is just a problem solver. And he inspires his people to get, or, like, the whole village to get around the vision and let's do this. And so we basically said, start with what you have. That's kind of the water four method, too. Um, start with what you have and we're going to come and we're going to we're going to fuel it. We want to empower you to be able to do it for yourself. Um, and and that's all people need. They need a little a little jump start. And so. Uh, so anyways, in this village and just Leo Mays, I wish I would have brought in the list of what it is. But uh, from the time I came back and got married and went back uh, about 10 weeks ago, um, uh, I got to celebrate the 20th water well uh, that was dug and drilled. Um, and it was such an awesome celebration. But one of the most exciting things to me was that I walk into Tundu. <laughs> and at first I was like, like, no way. How is this happening? Like, all of a sudden I was walking through a forest of, of, of bananas. Like, uh, <laughs> and, and, and they had planted on their own. We, we had helped, too. Um, we, we help when we can, and, and we want to help so much more. But they had planted over 250 banana trees out there. Over 250 surrounding their village. Um, they had done uh, corn, a whole, whole field, huge field of corn. Uh, cassava, which is kind of like a, sp a spinach type, um, tastes kind of like spinach. Uh, they make sambe out of it. Um, they had done potatoes, sweet potatoes, peanuts, uh, maracuja or uh, passion fruit, um, and yams. Uh, that's eight. I think the list might have had nine or ten. But, uh, but they had done that all from, hey, if we get you your own land, do you think we could help you with water and you could help us with the labor, some of it, like taking the tools inside the village. Like they, they love that. They come and help us. Then it's like, Hey, if we want to get a farming project started, can we empower you to do that? We gave them some tools. We gave them some seeds. We gave them some banana trees and they just ran with it, man. And so, um, I don't know. I just, I just love seeing that if you empower someone instead of treat them like a charity case, if you give them an opportunity instead of saying, you can't do this for yourself. Get out of the way. I'll do it for you. Well, it's definitely a much more intelligent approach, and it's definitely better for them in the right. future, for now. Uh, it gives them that feeling of empowerment, the right. feeling that they're, they're improving and that their life is getting better because yeah. of their efforts. Almost dignity. It gives them something yes. to be proud of yeah. instead of something to be sad about. Like, oh, I can't do this for myself. Oh, I can do it. Yeah. You know? That's got to be cool for you to see. Yeah, oh, dude, I love it. What we want to do is go in there, teach the locals how to do it themselves, create a local economy for it and like stimulate that, give people jobs. Um, and then, and then let the community feel a part of it. So we look for day laborers in the communities we go to and give them a job while we're there, invite them in on the process, teach them some of it. We've, we've acquired some of those guys that are just big, strong, love helping people. Now they're part of our team. Um, but the core of our team graduated from university in degrees of community development. So that's what we want to do. We want to go in there, empower the locals. And yeah, I'm a, I'm a big part of it. And, but what I want to do is be able to fan the flames and say, you can do it. Because a lot of international aid tells the locals that they can't do it for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe they don't say that, but it's kind of the way they go about attacking the problem. And you got to go about it in a way that, that kind of creates dignity for the locals instead of kind of robs them of dignity where they feel like they can't help themselves. That's a great way of approaching it. I'm really, I'm so happy you're doing that. I love that. I, lo I love that you're trying to help these people become a part of this solution, you know, instead of like someone solving right. it for them. Well, if I could say something to him real quick. Jiniango haiko mazungu. Jiniango efeosa babuti mangbo. And nafika hapaku wapenda. Nakupenda sana, sana. Sana, um, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm a goo, I'm a goo. And so basically what I'm saying is... I have no translator for that, you gotta help me. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm here, and my name's not white guy, but well, like a lot of Congo people call me, but my name's Efeosa, meaning the man who loves us, and Mabuti Mangbo, which means the big pygmy. And uh, I'm here because I love you, and you and me, we're brothers, you're my brothers, you're my sisters, I'm your brother. 
And uh, Amagoo Amagoo is uh, we are one, we are not different. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs>